Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, um, I'm not going to discuss the application process restoration uh, to enter uh, river systems with uh, uh, constraints to the restoration design. Um, this restoration, uh, I guess you all know how it might but just as a recap, um, to summarize the real fashion philosophy, it's just to catch the scale uh, the processes as much as is possible here and there. Uh, using these, uh, these terms here. Um, and in reality, uh, there's often constraints in most systems, and maybe why we're doing the work, it's why the constraints cause the work. Um, and so these type of constraints, when we're pulled back from this idealistic situation of restoration, but uh, I would argue there's still always the necessity to uh, include process, regardless of how constrained a site is, and it's essential in order to produce a sustainable and stable restoration design. So, in terms of process restoration, I like to describe the different this 2D space of restoration, um, where on the x-axis here we have uh, geomorphic dynamism or the potential of whatever to do geomorphic work against the degree of impact of physical process or the degree of constraint. So, um, at one end member we have this do nothing approach where there's sufficient uh, sufficiently high geomorphic uh, potential uh, and relatively low impact that we can. Do nothing that will, will recover in an acceptable amount of time on its own. Uh, but we don't like to do nothing, we like to do something uh, as practitioners. As uh, so the next uh, uh, scale is assisted, what I call assisted recovery, it's uh, often termed assisted recovery. And this is the process whereby we would reduce the constraints to natural process, um, basically giving whatever a bit of a kickstart uh, towards recovery. So doing things like the movement embankments or bank protection maybe um, uh, assisting with the supplies and bed load. So over time the river can naturally recover itself. But most restoration I think is in this uh, area, hence the larger oval here. And this is what I call initial conditions design, where we have moderate uh, degree of geomorphic potential for work and a higher degree of impact. And we have to give the river an initial condition with which to work on. So we give it our best guess of, of a stable channel and then allow the river to adjust that over time to reach a dynamic equilibrium. And then the end member of the other end is what I call functional design. Here we have such a small degree of uh, geomorphic potential and a high degree of constraint or uh, you know, impact to the physical process, but we pretty much have to give the river its final design. Um, and that's not to say that process isn't important uh, at that end member. Uh, process is essential in order that we produce uh, designs that are appropriate for imposed conditions. And I'll show an example later where um, the failure to do this results in, in the failure of the design. So I want to go through uh, two examples here, uh, two case studies, one in initial conditions design and one in functional design. Uh, and these two are the Edelson Water, uh, which is uh, in Scottish Borders. So this is an example of initial conditions design. And then uh, Mains of Dice, uh, which is an urban system in Aberdeen City. And also in Scotland, an example of functional design with a greater degree of uh, physical constraints. So, Elson Water, um, as I said, is a tributary of the Tweed in the Scottish borders joining uh, the Tweed of the Peebles. Um, it was canalised over about a five kilometre section in the 1790s relating to road construction. Um, and there's significant anthropogenic and natural cons uh, constraints to restoration. It's relatively low to moderate energy system. There are significant infrastructure services such as roads and uh, property and uh, power lines, etc. There's agricultural attachment uh, in, in the floodplain, the and there's also some uh, flood risk issues uh, in the catchment. This is what the channel looks like for the straight and section. It's been, as I said, it's been like this for uh, over 200 years. Um, embankments on both sides um, disconnect the channel from its, uh, from its floodplain. It's obviously very uh, limited in terms of uh, physical heterogeneity uh, and associated impact to, uh, to uh, ecology. Now, so we go through this process of design. Um, we don't just simply pick a new channel and go with it. We have to go through the systematic process, defensible process, to come up with uh, what is our best guess as initial condition design. So we start off, uh, here's a light out in this year of, of the site. Um, you see the, the existing channel here just 
going straight north south here, going down. There's these uh, drainage channels, Delfts here, and there's drainage in this part of Falkland here. But also, you can pick up this old historical channel here. Um, and so, this is our initial candidate uh, designed for realignment using this uh, some uh, version of this uh, historical channel. So, based on this uh, channel alignment, uh, we determine the proposed discharge and slope characteristics uh, for this, uh, this alignment. But a very important stage is to determine if this whole channel alignment is, is uh, appropriate for modern control variables. This is a channel that existed over 200 years ago, and land use and climate change in an intervening period has meant that there's potentially very different supply rates of uh, water and sediment to the system. So we did an assessment, and it, it was largely acceptable, and we made some adjustments to the, to the design based on how things have changed. Uh, the next stage is to determine general channel geometry. So using geomorphic regime or threshold relationships, we come up with a, a simple uh, channel geometry in terms of width and depth. And then we go through an iterative 2D modeling process. So we start off with this very simple uh, channel geometry and channel alignment, and we gradually add in complexity. So we add in uh, pools and riffles uh, and root structures as an iterative process to eventually end up with this final design. And this is our best guess of the we supply the river. So um, we assume it's, it's at a position where uh, it will fail uh, when, when it's uh, operational, but the river will adjust it. The river will adjust it to uh, identify um, or, or reach its uh, dynamic equilibrium state. So we constructed this a uh, little over a year ago, and this is it, uh, shortly after construction. Here you see the old channel running from uh, north to south here. We've retained some of the old channel for uh, backwater habitat, and here's the new Sinders channel with some large wood in the channel. Um, and already with one full event prior to scope got taken, there's some fine sediment that's collected on the inside of these uh, meander rings here. And also we have this uh, offline pond here, which becomes online in, in high in high flows as that sort of width and habitat. Now usually downstream from here, uh, there's another part of the design. So the design we just looked at is, is off this here. So the old channel uh, one runs straight through here and you can see these uh, drainage ditches and delves residents of the mirror. So we have this new realignment in this section. And if you notice this tree here, and you see a short series of photographs of, of, the, of the construction phase looking up, upstream towards this tree. So here's the first one. This is just at the beginning, um, uh, prior to the, 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 the build. This is the, the digger here in place. This is during the build process. This is immediately after the design process. So this is our initial condition we provided uh, to the river. And then this is after the first flood event. So already um, after the first flood event, we're getting increased uh, heterogeneity in the channel here. We're going to development of this uh, alluvial point lateral bar feature here, uh, driving a more asymmetric channel morphology, uh, channel geometry rather, and driving much more uh, diverse hydraulics. And then after a season of growth, this is one season of growth, we have, you know, the banks are well vegetated up, also macrophytes uh, colonizing the, the channel, and this uh, active level bar inducing much greater um, uh, morphological diversity and uh, associated benefit habitat. So it's on a trajectory to recovery, and we're monitoring it, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to show some more results of that in, in, in future talks. So the next um, case study with a greater degree of constraint is, is a functional design example, means of dice. It's a small uh, culvert of tributary uh, of River Dawn in Aberdeen City. It's um, a highly urbanized uh, and industrialized catchment. Um, and the footprint that we could use for this site is very much constrained. Previously, it had been uh, the site of an industrial site, and the river, the burn, had been uh, culverted underneath uh, the, uh, the site. Uh, the site was developed for housing. And because the footprint of housing it had to be going in this location, and that was, that was a, you know, absolutely fixed uh, position of the channel. And this provides a good example of how the failure to consider a geomorphic process in the initial construction resulted in failure. So the housing developer initially uh, constructed the channel, and he constructed this um, based on a ditch showing directly down the, the, the strike of the slope uh, through unconsolidated material, nothing in there to, you know, no grade control or anything in, in the channel to, to prevent erosion. But, 
And about a week after this photograph was taken, we got a 40 year flood event. And this happened. Um, this is before we were involved. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so we got this massive head cut. This is the head cut here. There's about two meter waterfall off, off the end of here. And massive incision, huge amount of sediment loss, and entirely unstable. And just right to photograph here, we've, we've got a housing development, so completely you know, unstable and inappropriate for, for that. So we were taken on to, to design a stable channel for this. Um, and because of site constraints, we're a very um, high imposed slope, so the only natural analog for this in terms of morphology is a step pool design. So using this type of relation, this relationship here, this empirical geomorphic relationship uh, for the morphology of a step pool channel, so this is the, the height of the step the length between steps, uh, the general basal slope of the channel uh, related to this, well, it's not constant, it's uh, this is the value we picked, it's not all variability around this in nature, but we started off with this. Uh, and we produced from that, we produced this initial design. And uh, this, this is the, you know, the steps and pools, uh, also exaggerated in, 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 in the vertical. Um, and as a pre as a, as a pre of the design, these steps had to be stable because of the, the risks in housing development. That it's, the steps had to be stable. So we, we, we modeled to ensure that was going to be the case, and we adjusted the design iteratively again until we produced our, our final design, which we implemented uh, about uh, two years ago now. This was immediately after implementation. And so here we have the, the series of steps here, which you know, had to be stable. But in between the steps, which, um, in between the steps, we have these uh, cobble uh, bench or, or, or uh, berm features. So this was to allow some degree of process, to allow some bedwell transfer to operate in between these steps to you know, induce some uh, natural process. So you've seen this already, but this is three years later. Uh, you know, really nice little vegetated that the banks are entirely stable. All the steps are, are intact, they haven't moved up despite some very large flood events. It's a very dynamic system. Very flashy because of its urban, uh, urban catchment and its very steep slope. Um, but there has been, as you see, this, this redistribution, this reworking of this cobble sized material, and that's adjusted uh, the morphology uh, of the site. And here's a good example of what's happened. Um, so, despite us having uh, have a fixed design um, in terms of the, the step location, steps are, are, are fixed, it has actually adjusted its morphology uh, by Burying some of these uh, these step features, so effectively changing its ratio between step height and step spacing. So it's adjusting its morphology uh, to more optimally dissipate energy. Um, and so the incorporation of physical process into this design has allowed this. Um, so despite us we're calling this functional design, we're, we're giving the river its final design. It's actually moving back a bit towards its initial conditions design. It's actually even in such a constrained site, if you include process fundamentally in the design. You're allowing the river to adjust, and we'll we never design a river as well as the river can design a river. So, having this it provides them much more uh, ability for, for a sustainable design and restoration. So, to um, quickly conclude, um, explicit consideration of uh, physical process and restoration design, I would argue, is essential. Um, there's this fundamental principle in process restoration that the reproduction of uh, natural process, physical process, has an associated ecological benefit. And so to do that, we have to introduce natural uh, physical process into our design, regardless of the constraints to site and scale. Um, it also gives us a better understanding of risk in these designs. Uh, we're able to if we understand the processes and then the related uncertainties of the processes, we can quantify risk better, and that gives us a better opportunity perhaps to have these uh, textual designs approved and implemented. And it's important though in order to do that, we have to have this systematic, me systematic methodology that I, I showed an example of, which has to be theoretically and evidence-based uh, in order to be uh, defensible. Um, and related to these issues, uh, there is further development needed in, in relation to this uh, 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 embryonic uh, process that we're, we're, we're dealing with here. So, there very much needs to be further research on this, this, as I said, this assumption in process restoration that improving physical process has, a, has a, a, an ecological benefit. Now, in the medium to long term, I'm sure that's the case, but there's very little evidence to, to show that, and especially evidence in relation to physical river restoration um, uh, works. Um, and related to this, um, we um, need to have much more careful, uh, careful design monitoring. 
first conference I went to 20 years ago, people were talking about uh, more monitoring, but it's still the case now, I think. Um, not only does that provide the, the, um, the linkages between uh, the physical and the biological, so we can understand how these uh, processes operate, but also it can feed back to our design methodology, so we can refine our design methodology and uh, produce a more defensible approach to producing sustainable restoration designs. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, some work that's been done for the last four years, effectively, on uh, a river in Northern England, River River, uh, which involves naturalisation. Now, it's, uh, if you like, it's a little bit less hands-on than the, uh, the um, work that uh, Amy just presented. The idea, essentially, is that we, we give the river a bit of a kick-start to try to restore um, some processes or work with that natural processes at the moment so that we get a, a system which is um, where the form of the channel is, is, is developing and responding according to the current conditions. Now it's a project which, um, as I say, has been going for, for four years or so. There have been various people coming in and out of the project, um, including myself, uh, Seth Bentley at the bank there from JBA, and uh, Neil Pinkwistle um, from Salford University. But essentially the, the, the main driver uh, behind all of this work is uh, Alison Wally from um, the Environment Agency, and she's seen, she's seen this sort of thick and thin, um, and has, has basically succeeded in getting four phases of work um, activated on, on the site uh, over the last four years or so. So I want first of all to, to show you the sort of motivation for the naturalisation of that site, um, show you then what we've done, um, and give you some, uh, some pretty pictures really, it's all qualitative, uh, linked to the, the responses of the system um, as a result of, of those activities. Um, and these, these are qualitative at the moment because the survey was only essentially done last week and processed. So, um, as I say, it, it's, it's at that level of pictures only at the moment. Um, just to finish on that as well, though, I will, I will go through some of the, the constraints that, that we faced um, from the initial idea of a, a very much an unconstrained vision and, and a way forward to um, the sort of compromises that we, that we had to make. So, uh, first of all, the, the sort of motivation behind it, but the condition of the site, as you can see here, it's, it's a triple SI site in, in the UK. Uh, and interestingly, the triple SI boundary only follows the river, so that none of the floodplain is, is uh, under, under that classification. That has proved a little bit of a problem for us. Uh, I think now we, we're all beginning to understand that we have to treat the river and the floodplain as, as a single unit and, and work. Um, with both the river and the floodplain. And, uh, you know, over, over the four years of uh, uh, works, we certainly have done that. And, and both the river and the, the floodplain have been um, worked on to restore natural processes. But essentially, the science is, was pretty poor. It's been, although it, although it looks relatively natural, nice scenery sort of system, um, it, it has been uh, fairly extensively modified. It's been dredged, it's been embanked. Uh, the tributaries that used to flow into the system have all been um, cut off essentially and then transferred down the side of the valley. Uh, you know, lots and lots of um, historic uh, pressures on the system. And as a result of that, it was, it was uh, classified as um, unfavourable uh, in terms of the, the triple SI uh, classification. Now, in order, in order to, uh, to change that, we, we had to put together a, a, a restoration plan or a naturalisation plan, um, and that, that involved um, a series of, of potential interventions, all of which were um, which stemmed from um, pretty detailed sort of hydrological investigations of the site, uh, which, which linked up uh, geomorphologists with ecologists as well, so that we understood uh, some of those linkages there. Now, early on, there was a, there was a phase one, phase two, 2011-2012, and you can see just about from, from the picture there that quite a number of measures were undertaken. A lot of them were actually undertaken on the floodplain. We did a lot of floodplain realignment. We did a lot of fencing to keep out sheep and uh, cows, etc. Um, we worked on paleo feature reconnection um, and changing the uh, flow dynamics through 
uh, construction of tube channels, etc. And that, that basically followed through phase two as well, uh, with, with sort of very similar approaches. Phase three and phase four have also gone ahead, um, but they are largely uh, linked to um, flood bank realignment. So, just a couple of examples. I think this is a really interesting one to start with. Just this simple fencing of the site, which, which essentially changed the, the way that the, um, the land, you know, on, on, the, on the preserve side, if you like, of the fencing was, was, was managed. Um, you know, without the livestock there and without the sort of grazing pressures, etc., then there was a really dramatic change very quickly in the uh, vegetation composition and, um, you know, certainly a change for the better. So, um, a very, really very cheap and uh, effective uh, initial approach. We recognised, obviously, that the, um, we'd lost uh, a number of troops coming into the, into the channel. Um, one opportunity that did, did arise was to actually take uh, a couple of those tributaries out of the culverts of the green um, and to basically to um, bring the water back to the surface. And that very, very simply, very quickly uh, created several hundred metres of uh, you know, flowing tributary channel uh, across, across the uh, floodplain area. So we be, we're beginning to wet up that, that zone as a result. Similar to that, there are a large number of features across the, across the floodplain which um, had been disconnected historically from, from the water course. Um, and it was, a, again, a relatively simple exercise to, to begin to reconnect those features. And as a result of that reconnection, you can see uh, you know, lots of areas where um, we went from uh, essentially a dry, fossilised uh, feature and, and habitat to one which is now uh, largely functional with uh, in line with the flow regime in the channel. There was a, there was a concern at the site in terms of fisheries of um, overly mobile gravels in the system as well. Um, and one, one of the uh, approaches to, to begin to stabilise those gravels was to create additional channel capacity um, at the site of, of the water courses. You can see just about there uh, a really quite nasty um, nastily designed or nastily executed uh, shoot channel. Uh, unfortunately, when you leave the contractors alone, they, they tend to go back to our carriers and put trapezoidal um, channels in where, where you, you actually design something a lot more variable. But uh, luckily, the river uh, over time is, is adjusting that. We'll see later on that it's becoming a much more natural feature as well. Additional uh, attempt to, uh, to lower the energy within the system was to uh, widen the channel um, and to create these sort of wider gravel burn areas on the inner banks. Uh, very useful in terms, as I say, of lowering the velocities in the system and also very useful in terms of um, increasing the supply of gravel locally from uh, the, these areas into the, into the river itself. So it's sort of a double purpose for that type of feature. Away from the main channel, we also had an opportunity to, uh, to work on a, a pretty degraded uh, tributary um, of, of the water course. You can see here, this is, this is how it was originally. Uh, basically, it's been dredged out. No, no real features, just a lot of silt in the bed of the channel and culvert into towards the end. So uh, we, we took away the culvert, um, increased the gradient a little bit, and put in some um, pull ripple sequences along that channel with the idea that it would provide better uh, habitat, particularly for trout. Um, you can see here a couple of these features uh, which, were, which were reinstated into the waterfall. The, the result of, of, of putting those systems in, or putting those features in as well, is that um, we, we effectively raised the water table locally there and uh, made a significant difference to the, uh, the sort of hydrological regime of the uh, floodplain immediately adjacent to that, uh, that small tributary. And uh, you, know, you can see that it's been significantly wetted up. As I said as well, you know, this system prior to, um, to our, our sort of uh, manipulation of it was, was a, a pretty active uh, channel. So you've got 
a number of paleo features um, located very close to close to the water course. And again, very simple uh, and low cost uh, reconnection work went ahead there, which which then again um, basically allow flow back into those uh, fossilised features. And there you can see uh, the exit of one of those, one of those paleo channels as it, uh, uh, well, pretty much after a, a, a sort of high uh, summer, summer flow. So those, those features now, they're wet in the winter and they're wet during uh, flood events. So, you know, that's a quick summary of the, the, the approaches that we've taken. Fairly hands-off, as I say, we didn't, we didn't go, we, you know, the intention wasn't to, to drastically change the system, but really to give the system a, a chance to, um, to recover itself. Now, we've, we've very recently been out to the site um, using some of these new uh, drone technology. Um, we were able to, to survey the site in, in about half a day and uh, process the, the pictures overnight. And essentially that gives you a, a very useful um, auto-rectified image of, of, the, of the area, which obviously we can compare to um, the, the morphology before the works were undertaken. Now you can see from, from this little picture underneath, um, the detail that you pick up is, is really very good from, from these, uh, these drone, these drone uh, units. You can see I've zoomed in here. Unfortunately, I actually used the, the PowerPoint uh, slide graphic to zoom in, so you don't really see the, the, the true quality of, of the image on, on this one, unfortunately. But what, what I hope you can see is the fact that we, you know, we can very easily distinguish between different uh, sediment types within the channel, the, the cobbles, the gravels, and, and the, the fine material there. So there is, there is a lot of detail uh, captured from the, the survey. And you can see that again here in terms of the process. You can see the cantilever failure of the of the banks there and the, the blocks that have dropped into the river channel. You see the different hydraulic habitats um, operating in, in the water course. And you get a, a, also a feel of the, the bed as well. So what happened? Moving the flood banks, we can see very, very significant um, difference here with cattle exclusion, with livestock exclusion, and you know the development of much more um, varied, diverse vegetation and morphology. The shoot channel, you know, it still doesn't look very nice, but it, it does function in the way that, uh, that we wanted it to, it has started to develop. Uh, the result is it, it, it has slow gravels in this region here, so we're getting deposition and it's also slowed the erosion on the outer bank there. And you can see in these close-ups that there's head cut erosion going on in the shoot channels. They are beginning very much to naturalise themselves. Inner burn areas has encouraged deposition on that inner bank from previous, and it's created a more sinuous flow path, which has then led to erosion uh, of the bank on the, on the downstream end there. So again, we are seeing uh, processes uh, and erosion deposition coming back into the system. Paleo reconnection, uh, as I say, really easy to do at this particular site because they were so uh, close to the, the, the uh, natural channel, and you can see the you know the development of uh, really diverse and uh, active habitat as a result of, of that reconnection. Tributary daylighting, where we've, we've taken the uh, water out of the culverts. Again, very significant change in terms of the, uh, the floodplain wetness here. Uh, a real big difference, as far as I'm concerned, from, from again, a very, very small intervention. And riffle creation. Um, I'll finish on this last one. It's not, not as positive as, as some of the other photographs I've shown you. That's, that's the old system. This is the new one. You can see, okay, we've got rid of the cold look. We've um, had some success there. Um, but very hard to see the riffles. You can zoom in. Still very hard to see the riffles, although you have got the uh, area of wetland very definitely wet up. 
reason you can't see the ripples is as soon as they were put in, basically we had to take them out um, due to some uh, disputes with, or, or uh, yeah, it was a dispute really with the, the, um, the landowner. So, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult one. You, you have to tread very, very carefully in terms of uh, doing some of these things. And ultimately, you know, things can go wrong pretty quite quickly. Summarising that, you know, there are a lot of constraints. Farmers being, being one of them, um, you know, they, they've got a lot of people, they, they use that land, they don't necessarily want to get too much of it up. Anglers as well were, were um, quite vociferous. They like things to stay pretty much as they were, rather than uh, allowing things to change. Um, even some of our, our sort of natural organisations, our nature organisations, RSPB, etc. Put up objections, but for instance, in terms of um, putting trees on the on the floodplain, because they felt that that would then encourage uh, birds of prey practice uh, in that area, and then that would impact on the uh, waterfowl. So difficult to to sort of tie all those things together. And there were there were some uh, concerns over the uh, the changes that we were making to some of the historic uh, flow management. A couple of pictures of that. That's what caused all the problems with the farm. A little puddle about that big, but then we had to take all the ripples out as a result. Very sad and true. So, to conclude, I think, or at least I hope, what we've seen is the fact that we, we can adopt some pretty simple approaches uh, in terms of naturalisation, provided that, that we understand how those um, interventions are going to influence form and process. And by doing those interventions, we can, we can restore some dynamic uh, activity to the water sports. It is, it is a delicate process, as I've shown you with the farmers and, and other people. Uh, you know, it's been described really as a social science in terms of uh, being able to take all these things forward. And it can very easily become derailed, which is a shame. Uh, but basically, I hope from the, the photographs, at least, you can, you can appreciate that there are um, very significant and very rapid morphological rewards uh, as a result of the work. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, so, yeah, as uh, Alexander just said, I'm here to talk about some work we've been doing um, for the Environment Agency and the Eugenia Rivers Trust um, in the Rivers Eugenia in, in the southern, uh, northern south coast of England. So, I'll briefly talk about the the problems in the country, why we are doing the work, um, the partnership that was put together to deliver it, um, three of the sites that have been delivered, um, and then from, the, from the, the, those sites we try and draw some summaries of what's worked, uh, what's constrained the success of the measures perhaps, and also to put, put, draw some final lessons. So to orientate you, um, I don't know if anyone knows the South Coast of England, but um, the use of lane catchments are relatively small. They are either side of the uh, South Downs, they're, they're near the tourist city of Brighton. Uh, but for those of you who know where Gatwick Airport is, does anyone know where the Gatwick Airport? Gatwick Airport is just here, in fact, that helps orientate you. Um, another the, the previous, previous examples, they, these are, are low energy systems. Um, they're, they're lowland, quite seniorously meandering catchments uh, with fine grain geology, um, but from a, a band of chalk in the South Downs, they're, they're generally underlaid by sandstones, siltstones, and mudstones. And at first, first glance, they look a bit like a, a sort of stereotypical English countryside rural idyll. Um, but in fact, they've actually been heavily modified. They're very rural catchments, but there's been modifications over the last, say, 400 years for uh, land drainage, for milling, uh, and for navigation primarily. Uh, with luckily some flow gauging and water resources as well. Um, and the channels are extensively straightened. They've got much larger capacity than they would actually have, uh, and they've also got a lot of weirs in the, in, along each channel. So the main impacts of this are a loss of geomorphological diversity pretty much across the board in, in most of the reaches, the Tukumich River. Um, a lot of disconnection from the frog plane. Um, the channel has been enlarged, 
significantly and water just doesn't get out into the floodplain as often as it would naturally do. Um, and as a result of both of those issues, there's been considerable reduction in habitat quality. Um, so as a result, all the water bodies in both catchments are failing the uh, WFD target. <coughs> and also there's increased flood risk, um, particularly on the ooze where the town of Lewis is very prone to flooding. So because of this, the environment agency set up um, really two projects, but I'll uh, back to this one. The Eudelida Restoration of Physical Habitats project, uh, they're called Arthur for the Ooze, and Morph, which is the Middle Ooze Restoration of Physical Habitats. Um, to implement them, uh, the environment agency took the lead. They, they were the lead partner, very much the driving force behind the project. They also provided most of the money. Um, they work very closely with the Ewes and Rivers Trust, uh, who has a catchment officer on the ground, uh, and who was able to work with the landowners and uh, really to build on what, what George and uh, uh, Richard said about getting landowners on board was very important. And we had someone on the ground who was trusted by the locals. Uh, and ourselves, that while that's only DHV, brought in as design consultants. Uh, so the landowners were engaged very much from the outset. Um, with the environmental agency, we identified probably about 30 sites across both river catchments that needed work to be done, uh, ranging from full river restoration to uh, uh, fish paths, installation for some gauging structures. Um, and we, we were very closely involved with the landowners at each stage um, to establish what they would be happy with. To, 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 to take place on their land and what they wouldn't tolerate. Um, and from this, we identified three sort of pioneer landowners. Um, so there's the Net Pass Estate on the River Ada. Um, the picture on the, uh, on the right there is, is a picture of the finished product with some of the natural great grazing form of that, um, some fallow deer. Um, we identified uh, yeah, the Spring Meadow site on the River Ouse and the Buxton Park site on the River Up, which is the most tributary of the Ouse. So, we basically had a different, slightly different approach, different aims, and different constraints at each site. So we started off with the, uh, the net parcel site. And the aim here was to improve, primarily was to improve floodplain connectivity. Um, the river very much functions as a canal. It's been enlarged and pushed to one side of the floodplain, so uh, the land, which is quite poor quality clay land, uh, could, be, could be farmed. Um, but the landowner, uh, was King Estate, uh, he realised that he wasn't making any money from farming, or his, his, his uh, parents weren't making any money from farming. So when he took over, he basically made quite a brave decision to, to, to stop. Uh, there was no agriculture going on in the estate, and he was letting it rewild. It's part of a very big project, a net rewilding project. Um, there's lots of people about that. Um, and as part of that, he wanted to, to get the river behaving naturally. Uh, from his perspective, there was no, no real no constraints at all on what could be done. But unfortunately, their nature isn't quite so uh, understanding, and there's some very sensitive flood risk receptors in terms of a road bridge, which is only just above the front lane. And also, there's a, a, a large castle mound and a small keep that was built in the 1200s, uh, and the, the English heritage would be very nervous about anything happening to that. So our approach here was to, to follow a detailed design approach. We had lots of hydraulic modelling because of the flood risk implications. We used a, a combined one the ISIS model uh, to look at water levels and flows in the, in the main channel, and a two flow model to look at what happened when the water came out to bank onto the top plane. Um, and we used the modelling outputs to identify the capacity that we needed to flood the top plane as often as possible. But and you perhaps look at the, the paradox here, but whilst preventing increases in flood risk elsewhere out of this particular site. So it's, it's quite a tricky job. On one hand, we're trying to get lots of water out all the time. On the other hand, we had a, a road to that was very close and we couldn't flood, basically. So what we did uh, in the end was reduce the capacity of, the, of, of one kilometer ch of channel um, and, but basically just like to meet the channel across the floodplain following a, a paleo channel. Um, it's about a kilometre long, the picture of that on the right there. 
Um, also, one of the additional one and a half kilometres of the large channel that I uh, regrowed the banks and basically creating a low flow channel. Um, we took two large weirs out. Um, and we've got a lot of debris in. That's the season. We can debris here. Um, with all sorts of uh, burn features that were actually slightly submerged by the relatively high water levels here. Um, we also um, blocked lots of floodplain drains and we did some scrapes to get water to stay on the floodplain and when it would leave when it would be flooded. Um, and these have actually been very successful and been enlarged by um, uh, a herd of wild pigs that the landowner has released. On the, on the estate, and then they've been moving around and they've largely scraped under unexpected currents. And moving on to the uh, spring meadow site of the ooze, this is uh, again uh, a piece of river that has been enlarged and moved to the edge of the floodplain, so the field, the, the farm can have one field to, to, to cultivate. Um, but the aim here was to, to naturalise the flow regime by taking out a, a wheel. Uh, a lock, a uh, redundant lock channel, this was handled by, by a boat, um, to improve the channel habitat, so we're doing that. And also, crucially, to, to try and maintain some coarse gravel substrate. So, although, although most of this system is going to be fine, there's quite a lot of coarse gravels here, but the problem is, the problem is that the, the channel is so large and the energy is so low that the, the, the gravels are completely obscured most of the time. There's a lot of silt on the top. So, the key considerations that we had to take into account here were some sensitive grazing meadows um, and natural England's one of the UK regulators were very nervous about anything happening to these meadows so they didn't want the river moving about everywhere and having to, um, to have the, the meadow regenerate over a long period. Um, there's also a narrow gauge tourist railway over, if you just off of this picture, you, you can't see it here but it basically just runs along this line of trees, along this line of trees. Um, and because of the, we, we didn't want the river to move about too much. So again, we took a detailed design approach. Um, we did some fun modelling, but, but it was very basic. We, we didn't do any foundation modelling like we had with the, the net castle site. Um, we basically <coughs> reinstated a, a paleo channel. And Within that, we created a, a, a meandering low flow channel that could try and focus flows during the lower, period of lower, lower flow and keep the gravels cleaner. Um, and then we had a, a, a multiple stage channel up on top that could take the flood flows and not, not reduce the beds too much. Um, the third site up at uh, Oxford Park, completely different. Um, again, we had the same length, very impounded reach here, and there's absolutely no energy. This was impounded for about like, 750 metres upstream of a kind of small weir actually. Um, and the aim here was to, to really completely restore functionality as much as we can. Um, it's in the grounds of a, a, a stately home, uh, the Jesus Hotel, wedding venue. It's out of the formal gardens, can't be seen from the formal gardens, has absolutely no use to land there, so he basically wasn't bothered about what we did. Um, there is public access on the site, so you have to be mindful of, of, of the public footpath bridge. There's also a fishing lake, um, which I'll come to later, that, that, that very close to the river at some point. So that, that was a, a constraint we had to deal with. So what, what we did here was quite different from the other, other sites. We didn't really do much in the way of design work, other than some limited designs to um, uh, reprint on the back to either side we had, but basically the, the main purpose was just to take the weir out and let nature take its course. So there was a very limited intervention. Um, we did have to put willow spiling along um, past the bank. It's actually it's hidden under here um, because the fish lake is about seven or eight metres over the other side of a narrow neck of land. So basically just enough to get a, a tractor down. Um, so we didn't want the, the river to capture the lake. Um, we also seeded some gravel in some deep places. Um, and basically just left the region to take its course. So the, this is the result after, after um, a year uh, and a spring growth. And it's all pretty stable here. Um, moving on to this picture on the, on the right here, this is during the transition. The water has dropped from about there all the way down to the bottom. 
big chunks of back to that. So that happens all the way up for about 750 meters. So to try and bring this together, um, all three approaches have, have worked. They've achieved project objectives um, of increasing geomorphological variability, um, allowing natural processes to operate more freely by taking impoundments and other constraints away. And they've also improved ecological habitat. So the monitoring of the environment takes the WFD for large purposes is focused on fish and uh, invertebrates. And fish populations have changed uh, and allowed to move upstream of the, of, of the obstructions. And at the net parcel site, it was basically a series of ponds that had carpet, which are not natural for the together. They've now gone, they've moved elsewhere, and small natural fish sandwiches have come in. So they're, they're ecologically, they work very well. However, uh, geomorphologically, um, natural adjustment of the net parcel site is quite limited because of the clay substrate. The, the very, very, very easy you can make uh, models out of it, 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 it grips out of it, 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 uh, it doesn't go anywhere. And because of the flood constraints, you have to engineer the channel slightly more than we wanted to. Um, that says, the animals that, that roam, the pigs and the, the deer are doing their bit to, to reprofile the banks more for us and break, break, break the structure. Um, at the Spring Meadow site, there's already been some adjustment within the, the high flow bank line. Um, and at Bucks Park, so it's been extremely successful for more people. What we wanted to do, again, from the nature of free hand pretty much, and uh, it, it's worked very well. So, trying to destroy together, um, pretty quick, two more sides. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, that the design approach we used and the, the sort of free and natural adjustment approach we used were both achieved project objectives, um, we're working towards good ecological status for the, 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 the road and water bodies. Um, but for, certainly from a hydromorphological perspective, um, not necessarily from an ecological perspective, but I'm afraid I don't have full data, but I'm told that actually the ecological results are better at the net class or something than any of the others. Um, but from a hydromorphological perspective, the, 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 the least intensive approach in terms of design intervention has worked best. So the, the Bucks and Park approach will be able to take the rear out and then they take the course. It's introduced a lot more hydromorphological variability. So within constraints, well, one of the lessons we've learned from that, I suppose, is that we try and keep design to a minimum. Um, and then that natural process is to operate as much as possible. Obviously, we're going back to any mission to try to a lot of constraints, and that's not necessarily possible on the side. Um, the, 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 the more project bucks did and uh, Spring Meadow decides to the award from the Wild Travel Trust, and although it looks like something the line that your bills have put together, it's actually probably uh, we were very proud of it's quite a prestigious award for us to win. And finally, it's just sort of looking a bit wider than my own project, I suppose. Um, one of the key lessons we learned from the project is that talking to landowners and telling them what hydromorphology means is, is, is vital. A lot of people are not necessarily familiar with food and geomorphology, and it was quite important to manage their expectations um, as to what would happen, particularly back to the park site where it looks, you know, in fact, on the right here, in some ways, it so it looks like a big mess with key shots and bags and bits of grass falling out everywhere. Um, but once the landowners were made aware of what would happen, they were all very, very supportive. Uh, and one of the key to the measures of the success of this, this whole scheme, I suppose, is at least three projects have been used as examples for other, other schemes, other, other landowners within the, the catchment. So, the fact that there wasn't a disaster at Spring Meadow on that castle or Buxton Park means that we can use the, 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 you know, the outcomes of these sites to, to demonstrate to other landowners that are less good perhaps that their land will still be far more once we've done something to the river. Um, and the pipe should be maintained and there's, there's, there's more schemes underway at the moment. Uh, the National Trust have got a site adjacent to um, Spring Meadow site, and they, they, they want to do something similar on their land. So, that's a big driving force, so a bit of momentum for spring restoration and action that's been very successful. Okay, that's, that's it for me. Any, any questions? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Today I will talk about my diploma thesis, which
which deals with um, morphological impacts on flood peak dampening. Uh, so to say floodplain evaluation, and I use the floodplain evaluation method to do my investigations. To introduce you to the topic, I will firstly compare the um, demands of the EU floods directive with the current situation in Austria. Um, then I will talk about the objectives, followed by uh, the methods and the capturing. And um, in the middle of the presentation, I will show some results followed by a short discussion and the conclusions. Uh, uh, the EU Floods Directive demands the preservation and restoration of natural inundation areas. At the left figure at the bottom, you see the daily consumption of land or construction and traffic in Austria uh, for the period 2004 to 2010, as well as the target value of the Austrian sustainability strategy, which is 2.4 hectares per day. And you can see that this value was exceeded each year. And at the right figure, you see where this uh, land consumption takes place. The white areas here are mountains, and the uh, colored areas are settlements. So especially in um, mountainous regions, like here in Tyrol, many uh, the, the valleys are densely populated, and so many types of land use compete for this rare space which uh, threatens the floodplains. At the moment, we are losing floodplains, but we don't know how efficient they are. Therefore, I tested and improved this uh, method at the smaller river um, to ev ev evaluate and compare these floodplains. Um, this uh, method delivers a qualitative assessment of the floodplains, so to say a listing of the floodplains. Um, ranked by their efficiency in regard to hydrological parameters, uh, which I will explain in the next slide. And this list should then uh, be a supportive tool for land use planners and decision makers. Okay, let's go to the method. We have the hydrological and the hydraulic parameters. Um, the hydrological parameters are flood peak reduction, delta Q, here, and flood wave translation, the delta T. Um, we have here the new inflow wave to a certain ridge, which is detected here, and a reshaped, per the reshaped purple outflow wave, which is detected here. And the reshaping takes place uh, when the water flows through this uh, ridge and the uh, flood plants uh, are inundated. Looking at the hydraulic parameters, we will see to water level, flow with soft velocity, shear stress, specific discharge, and higher risk um, when we cut off part of the floodplains or the whole floodplains. All these parameters will rise, and this has also adverse consequences for third parties. Uh, this slide is just to show you where um, my investigation area is in the Danube catchment. Here we have this in detail, here we have Austria, and this is the uh, catchment of the Rumu River. Um, the river Mu flows through Austria at a total length of 300 kilometers, and the area of the catchment is around uh, 10,000 square kilometers. And I investigated around 140 floodplains, uh, um, a 152 kilometer long reach in the upper basin and a 44 kilometer long reach at the lower basin. And for my investigations, I used 2D hydrodynamic models, which you can see here on this slide. The color here stands for the ele uh, elevation, and so this is the highest part of the model, where the inlet is, and the water flows from the inlet here to the outlet, and at the inlet and the outlet, the hydrographs are detected. Um, when, a, when this uh, hydrograph goes through the model, after a certain discharge is reached, the river will start to overtop, and then the water that flows through the flood plain has a low flow velocity, so this uh, reshaping of the hydrograph takes place. Um, I have prepared a small video to show you that. Try to start this. Okay, first the channel fills up, and after, uh, oh, sorry. First the channel fills up, and after a uh, certain discharge is reached, 
the uh, inundation starts here and the lower parts are inundated. And after uh, higher discharges reach, also the higher parts of the floodplain uh, is inundated. So it's depending on the morphology of the floodplain how these uh, inundation patterns are. So each floodplain is different. Okay, let's go to the results. Here we have again the, uh, some floodplains along the river and the delta Q and delta T values for two floodplains. Um, this innovation, uh, notation here uh, says that the river, this floodplain is located at river kilometer 285 at the left side. This is important for, uh, for some later figures. Um, we see here now that the delta Q values are different, 2.1, 0.3. Each of the floodplains has an impact on flood, uh, uh, delta Q and delta T values, but the question is now which uh, floodplains are very important, the very efficient. To um, answer these questions, uh, question I have um, separated the river in uh, morphological uh, homogeneous reaches, which you can see here. This is a 33 kilometer long reach. We have the absolute peak re discharge reduction in cubic meters at the vertical axis, and here we have the positioning at the river, starting at the highest point at kilometer 288, and then it goes down downstream. But these are absolute values, and I can't compare them. Therefore, I have edited them. These here uh, are now the values in percentage of peak re discharge reduction in the whole. Um, whole reach. Here we have uh, again the positioning at the river, but the floodplains are all, already sorted uh, by their efficiency. So this means that this floodplain here contributes 18% to the peak discharge reduction in the whole reach. At this slide, you, uh, I have introduced um, put threshold values, um, which is here 5% of the cumulative effect. This floodplains have together 5% of the cumulative effect. And um, the blue ones should deserve special protection, so we, should, we don't should lose them. Uh, to save some time, I uh, show you the other parameter, the other hydraulic parameter in its final form, and here we have the threshold value of 15 minutes. This uh, value has proven to be very practical. Now let's go to the hydraulic uh, parameter. Here we have again floodplains, and at these red uh, lines are cross sections, which you see here. And I built fictive dams uh, into the model, so to see what happens when we cut off the floodplain. And you see here, this is the normal water level without a dam, and this is the water level with a dam. And here you can see also that uh, larger floodplain, the increase in water level is bigger for larger floodplains than in smaller ones. Here are, um, uh, again, the results for the water level for this uh, bridge, and here we have a, a 10 centimeter boundary. Now we have all three parameters for the fan metal, and I, we can uh, start the intersection. And the intersection uh, uh, works as follows. Uh, we have delta Q, delta T, and water level, and now the battery parameter decides. This means uh, here each line is a floodplain, and the battery parameter decides uh, means that only when all uh, parameters are marked yellow, the floodplain can be categorized as less important. All other floodplains, where only one, if only one uh, parameter is blue, should be characterized characterized as very important, and these floodplains should deserve special protection. Um, here we have the results for the reach I showed you before, with the parameters, and here we have the assessment, and you see that only two floodplains uh, are less important, and they are located here and here. So, um, here, uh, Two very important things for the flood peak um, reduction are the volume of the floodplain and the size. Um, you see here the floodplain size and uh, the relative peak discharge reduction in percent. 
What's, what here, what's here curious a bit strange, we have a very small floodplain with a very high impact on peak discharge reduction. It's nearly as high as this impact for the very big uh, floodplain. Uh, why is that so? Um, you can see here, this is the hydrograph of the small floodplain, that the overtopping of the floodplain starts nearly when the peak discharge uh, is reached, and so it, so uh, this form, uh, the, the hydrograph is reshaped in this form. At the large floodplain, the overtopping starts much earlier. You, you can see here the morphological impact, and when the um, peak discharge is reached, reach, the floodplain is already full, so it don't has uh, such a great impact. Well, this brings me then to the conclusion. Uh, the method uh, works very well in everyday practice. The qualitative assessment worked also very well and delivered clear results. And finally, I think it is a good support for land use planners and decision makers to protect the floodplains. Thanks for your attention.